So we're lovingly titling this conversation in consciousness, uh, why your clients are in my inbox. Because over the course of about the last month, myself and one of my peers have been off the hooks with cleaning up other people's problems. Which it's is more about that. Well, you know, it's been super interesting because a lot of these people have gone to practitioners and not just like decoders. Like I'm talking, this is a global thing. They're going to see like mediums or Reiki healers or Akashic readers, or I've had a couple of people that have gone to hypnosis sessions, gone wrong, things like this. And then afterwards, instead of going back to that person, when things aren't feeling right or settled, or, you know, they have questions about it, they're not going to their inbox. They're coming to mine. And I thought this was a really interesting conversation to have with everybody because there's so many of you in this group that are looking to be healers, already are, maybe you have your businesses already up and running. And I don't think we always look at the entire client pathway all the way through. And the reasons why we don't necessarily get those repeat clients like we think we should. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And why clients heal or hop. So what's really been kind of grinding my gears, knickers in a knot, just like, oh, driving me nuts this month is when people are coming to me, they're not coming to celebrate. They're coming because they're in a spin and something is not right, either in their bodies or in their minds or their beliefs or things just aren't settled after they've worked with a particular practitioner. And they're explaining their discomfort. And the reason they come to me is they know I'm going to call it like it is and ask the right questions to get to the bottom of it, to be able to pivot and to help steer them back on course. They know that that's the only reason they end up in my inbox, right? People know I just, I don't sugarcoat and fluff stuff up. Mm -hmm. But my question is, why aren't they going back to their practitioner? Why aren't they going back to the person who in, at least in that moment, they perceive didn't finish the job or didn't clean it up. And I think one of the things that is being done so poorly in the metaphysical arena right now is practitioners following through, you know, and, you know, Violet, maybe you can speak into this a little bit because you've been more on the other side of this when that client doesn't feel like you know what's actually wrong with them, you immediately lose credence Mm -hmm. with that person. Like the trust is gone. And if something goes wrong after that session, because they're on the fence and they're half letting you in and they're half keeping you out and they're half applying and, or maybe what we've touched or gotten into, they couldn't comprehend because you went way beyond them. We'll talk about that one in a second because, oh my God, I have been cleaning up some really interesting messes on that one. Um, when we are in that space where we truly haven't seen that person for what's going on and hit the right resonance field, you've just lost a client. And it's actually, you know, sometimes we can say, yes, the client does need to have that follow through and accountability. They need to be able to look at the entire picture with us and go, yeah, these are the elements I need to install and follow through on, et cetera. These are the elements that I got from today. And here's where I need to go further. But there's another side of it. There's another person involved in this interaction. And the healer is equally responsible for the outcome of that particular interaction. And I think there's another form of bypassing that's happening in a lot of ways where the healers are throwing their hands in the air and just going, well, this person was complicated or their walls were up or, you know, they just didn't want to heal. Yeah, that's a common one you hear. And like, to be frank, that's not actually a common situation, I find. Usually no. by the time somebody is willing to give someone their money in order to help them with a problem, they're usually in a space of, even if they're difficult to understand or, or they're doing a lot of dancing around the issue or you know trying to avoid it, deep down, they really do want to heal. They really do want to feel better and they don't want to be experiencing this anymore. And that's why they're actually reaching out and looking, you know, actively looking for someone to help them. 
Um, and so the, like the amount that I've heard people say, well, they just didn't want to heal does not jive with the reality of the situation, which is that the majority of people who are paying a healer to help them actually do want to heal. Um, but sometimes we forget that just because that person gave us money doesn't mean they automatically trust us. And that's the big key of it. And I think this is where a lot of us need to do a little bit of a self-check have we laid the groundwork to truly bring this client in on the journey with us? Have we actually seen them? Can you actually completely bring forward everything that's going on with them so that they go, they get me, they see me, they understand me. Because if that person has not had all of those markers hit, they will keep you at arm's reach and they should, because if you can't see the entire picture, you shouldn't be playing in their field. Yeah. You can hurt them. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why um, I know Caitlin hasn't been doing a lot of sessions recently, but for those of you who, who have had a session with Caitlin, you will know that like 90% of it is you guys just talking and like getting to know each other and talking about what's been going on before she even starts touching really anything because she needs like to get to know you and to make sure she sees the whole picture first. And you can't do that just by looking at someone when they first hop onto a Zoom call, like, or when you just say hello on the phone, like there are times too, for me, like I've hired a coach or a healer and I've given them money because I'm giving them a chance in that moment, in that interaction to say, look, I'm ready to show up. Mm -hmm. Are you as well? But I don't assume that person actually knows what they're talking about until we actually start talking and they can show me what they know and show me what they're picking up on. And I personally need to feel really safe in that environment. And if I don't, I'm not going to show them everything. So speaking of safety, there's, there's a couple of different archetypes of clients that show up that I think it's really important that all of us as healers, caregivers, practitioners, helpers, no matter what space you are at in this journey, you're all helpers in some fashion. Some people are in the state where they just blindly follow because they are just in that space where it's like, I need somebody else to tell me what to do. And if they perceive that you know what's going on, they will just let you lead without check and balancing everything you say to make sure it's right and aligned to their mission. And the benefit of that archetype and client Easy is that- it. They're easy to work with. You can coach them. They're adaptable. They're malleable. The con to that kind of client is they're malleable. And so if you've got it wrong because they feel so secure in just following everything you say, their energy field isn't going to give you appropriate feedback and you can push it too far or you can push it not enough or you can go in the wrong direction right? Yeah. You know, and they're not, they're not discerning at that stage, what is actually like right for them, or they're bypassing the signals their body is giving them that hold on this, this doesn't feel right. Yeah. So yeah, they're, they're easy to work with. But it to me, like if you're if those are the kinds of people you're looking for, that's kind of breeding a really lazy practitioner state. And it's dangerous for you and for them. Mm-hmm. In my perspective, then we have actually my favorite archetype client, Mm-hmm. who is the curious skeptic. I'll tell you why they're my favorite. The pro to these people is that they are open, but they are incredibly discerning and they have their hackles up. This the reason, me. yeah, that's you. The reason I like that is because I want people to check their fields and be like, yeah, okay, that feels like, no, that's a push. I want them to give me that rebound so that if something comes out of me that is wrong, their field, whether it's their mouth, their mind, or their body, immediately shows me I'm wrong so that I can ask another question or go a different direction. The Mm -hmm. curious skeptic for a healer is actually the safest one to work with in terms of creating changes in their bodies because they are borderline walking that line of actually learning what true sovereignty and autonomy is in their body, in their soul, in their mind space. And so you have to mentor them, not lead them. Mm -hmm. And so what I really like about that archetype is they are the easiest ones for me. They're the fastest ones to actually get 
all of this work, put it into play, change their lives, and just have everything work out as if by magic. Because all I have to do is hold the field, show them how to bounce this stuff a few times, and then they can do it for themselves. The con with those guys is that if you don't know how to work with them and you want to be right, because you're still in the space of being the showman, they're going to put their barriers up to you. Their hackle's going to be up and you're going to be like, oh, they're blocked. They don't want to heal. They don't want to move. No, my friend, you just don't know how to mentor them yet. You don't know how to hold space for them yet or how to actually show them like you're in control. You cultivate this environment and I'm just here to hold it with you. Yeah, because you're expecting them to be easy. Yeah. Yeah, and that's just like a recipe for disaster. (laughs) Yeah, I like the challenge people. Yeah. All right. Then we also have the ones who kind of play a dance between the aloof victim for quite a while where what they're actually really asking you for in those sessions is to be nurtured and held. They come because they're like, I want my life to change. But the first thing that they actually require is just to be seen and held and to feel good. Those clients, the biggest mistake healers make with them is trying to push them too hard, too fast, instead of teaching them how to first co-regulate to the fifth dimensional frequency field, and then how to start navigating back and forth through all of the different things that we need to do to clear up everything that's going on with them. And so the pro to these people is that they are some of the best long-term clients when it comes to that fine line of like intuitive life coaching. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that want to go on that entire journey of unfoldment. The con to them. And, you know, I think a lot of people in the room will relate to this one is that when they're doing that dance of the aloof and the victim, we are really quick to label them as the ones who don't actually want change. I would argue that you just haven't seen what they actually require. Yeah. Right. So then we have um, the people who are completely oblivious to what the actual issue is going on in their life. And they walk the talk, they have all the right things to say. And so the healer automatically assumes that they're ahead. Yeah. So you said they walk the talk. They don't walk the talk. They or talk. they talk the talk. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So they say all the right things. They understand what you're saying. They can go a mile a minute, just like you can. They they're like on the same level. They seem very advanced, but if you actually looked at what their life looks like, it's not matching their words. Yeah. But they're so good at giving you the speech, the words that you want to hear that you oftentimes not you, but just like oftentimes healers will just like not even go and double check, like what's actually happening in their life. They'll just take them at their word because they're so convincing. Yeah. Yeah. And these are the most dangerous clients to work with because they're already dancing that fine line between reality and their perceived dream state that if they have an accelerated healer who we're going to talk about next, because, um, I've been seeing this a lot too. And this is the one that's in my inbox the most right now to deal with. But if this person is already on that cusp and the healer doesn't notice that this person doesn't actually have a good grasp on this 3D reality collective experience and they push them over the edge into more of this higher dimension frequency stuff, they're walking this fine line between keeping this person grounded and able to exist and work with all the frequencies that are here and putting them into that psychosis state. And losing complete touch with reality. Yeah, very dangerous. Right? And I don't think people connect the dots with energy healing work. And this is why your clients are in my inbox. The reason they're in my inbox is because they know I'm a safe person and they've determined you're not. That's an an intense statement, but 100% transparency here. This past like two weeks, especially one of the things that has been in there a lot is people messaging me, even off of our YouTube videos, I'm getting this like people that I don't even know. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about practitioners that are sharing with them, like all of this crazy information stuff on like fractalization and getting up into these really high dimensional planes and like staying up in the dream state and all the new earth timeline templates and all of this. When, by the time this person messages me, 
their mental state is so flipped up that it is taking a lot to get them to ground back in their body and get control over the vessel they're in. And they get scared, like gun shy of all of this work. And if we don't get them soon enough, they start shutting it all back down. The other thing that's happening in that regard, when these practitioners are trying to accelerate things that are not ready to accelerate in that person's field, or they're trying to push it because maybe that's their interest, but it's not necessarily what's in the client's best interest, is we're having these um, dual timelines running where the person starts to separate and split where they're pushing their energy. And it just leaks all of their ability to actually go in any one direction. And they start creating a little bit of like a bipolarism. They can exist for a period of time over here and it's okay, but then they'll have a flip switch. Something will trigger and they'll exist over here and the two will never merge. And so they become further and further away from who they really are when really what they wanted was some help to get more in alignment with who they are and, and what they're supposed to be doing, what their timeline is, what their mission is. And this is the thing that's driving me nuts with practitioners. And you guys, this is, this is a global thing right now. Okay. This is not just like our community, for example, this is, I'm getting people coming in from other channelers. I'm getting people coming in from other healers. They're finding like our social channels. They're finding what I've talked about on YouTube. They've been like watching our um, email list, things like this. When we are trying to serve our interests and curiosity, it can never be at the expense of another human. And I get it because some of the information that comes in and the channelings that come in and things, they're so fascinating. I, don't, I probably share only about 2% of all the things that come in with you guys in this group because majority of what comes in, it's not appropriately timed to what people can handle right now, most people. And they will either distort it, misread it, or end up hurting somebody else with it. And what I'm starting to see is we're in this really big cusp period where the people who are getting some of this higher dimensional information, um, they're starting to misread the timing and inappropriately apply it. And so I think it's really important that we as practitioners really look at our own morals and ethics about how we run sessions and what is it that people really need. And listen, I'm only one voice. Maybe I'm completely wrong on this. Maybe I have no idea what's coming. Maybe I don't know like what we're supposed to be doing in the future. I, I could be wrong, right? L let's face it, I could be wrong. But I have a set of governing principles that I use that I check every single thing I'm about to do up against to make sure that I don't hurt people. I make sure that those boundaries are adhered to and I make sure I test it in that person's field that whatever we're gonna journey on together is going to expand them, not contract them or break them. Mm -hmm. And the fact that so many people, like you guys, I don't think, you get this, like in the last week, there are over 60 people who have messaged me who have had issues with a practitioner or a channeler or, you know, a QHHT person. You know, most of these are outside of our community. There's a few of them that are from inside. 60 people in seven days. Like that's not a coincidence. There's something going on here. And the fact that I'm having to clean up other people's messes, tells me that these other people don't know what they're talking about right now and need to take a step back and check into some of these foundational elements and see like, what am I doing that is causing this? And I started reaching out to some of the practitioners that I know that are at the base of some of this. There's a couple more I have to talk to over the course of this week, but oh, that's a lot, like 60 people. <laughs> I'd, Anyways, let's talk a little bit about how um, both as a company and as an individual, like as a practitioner, I came back to some core principles that we use in these sessions to be able to choose how I move, when I move, when I move it. And mm -hmm. maybe Violet, you can read through some of these and talk a little bit about them too, and we'll just rebound it. And 
our hope is you guys that are healers, practitioners, helpers, that you look at this and you start developing your own compass for this. Totally. Um, yeah. I have it up on my screen. I don't know if you want me to share it or just read it. Oh yeah. We could just share a screen. That'd be easier because some people read really well. Hold on. Let me um, make that so that you can. Okay. okay. You should be able to. All right. Okay. So these are our values and these are things that we, these are values that Caitlin has had for a long time. It just took us a bit of time to put them into words. So um, if you are a healer or you're working as somebody who helps other people, you probably already have a set of values that you follow and you just maybe haven't written them down or really considered them. Um, but I kind of made Caitlin go through the exercise of putting these into words so that we could clarify them for our students because we're teaching how to be a healer. You know, we're teaching people how to do that now and we need to be able to explain it. So um, if you have, if you haven't written your own down, this is a great opportunity to do that as an exercise, but these are ours that we've come up with and they um, are like the compass that directs everything that we do, all of the programs we create, all of the choices we make, all of the sessions that we do that our decoders do. This is, these are our values. So um, I'm hoping you guys can see this. I could probably increase the size of it a little bit here. Let's I think it's, I think it's up and it looks okay. Okay, so yeah. our first one is integrity. It's a pretty big word, it encompasses a lot, but basically um, our definition of integrity is that when you know better, you do better. So we're not looking for perfection. Um, we're always out creating what better looks like, which means we're always learning new things. We're always pushing ourselves a little bit further because we know that we're capable of more. And once, once we're able to do that, we up our integrity factor. It also means that we are operating within our scope of practice and um, we're serving people that like in a caring manner. So scope of practice is something Caitlin's talked about before and she can probably give a little bit more on it, but it's super important in us, which is a lot of what we've been talking about today already. Yeah. So scope of practice, essentially that what that means is you have a certain set of skills and parameters that either you've been trained to do, or perhaps you've been doing it your entire life. And you, because you know how to deal with those and recognize the situations with those, and you know, the boundaries of those elements, those are the things you practice. But if you don't know the things outside of that, you wouldn't just throw it on a client if you didn't know the ramifications of it. So the example I used with our decoders is, let's say you as a healer, you're looking at a client and you're like, oh my gosh, they have a walk-in. I'm just going to take it out, cross it over. It seems easy. Because that's, that, honestly, it's the easy part. Out of scope of practice. If you stop there. If you could go on the other side of this and go, okay, there's a walk-in, this is where it's hooked up. These are the hormones affected. This is the neurology that is impacted by this. These are the organs and glands that are gonna need a boost. This is the potential fallout from this client. These are the changes that are gonna happen in their body when this occurs. And this is the physical support plan I'm gonna have to give them so that this doesn't impact them to a big degree in scope of practice. If you can't see the follow through of every single one of the elements that you're about to do as a healer, don't touch it. And this is why people are in my inbox is because a lot of people have touched something and they haven't been able to close it or support it on the other end. And so they go to the person that they know can. Yeah. So they're demonstrating that in their experience, that healer is out of integrity. Yeah. So our next one is communion, which is uh, another word for communication. But um, the way that we see it is like, yes, you show up in a group, but you're still showing up as you yourself, the individual. So um, we're aware of the energy around us. We're, we're reading the collective energy and, and knowing what's happening with the other people around us and who we're in contact with, who we're talking to, who we're working with. And we're um, being a space of possibility for others to show up as all that they are as well. So it's like, we're aware of the collective energy, but we're not melding with it, if that makes sense. And part of that means we, we own our decisions, we advocate for our needs and we show up in a group setting and we communicate those effectively to other people. We don't expect other people to anticipate our needs and what, we, what we're looking for. So we show up sovereign, independent, as our own advocate, as our own best version of self to be the example for others to do the same. 
And then curiosity, this one is the shortest one. We question everything. <laughs> Conclusions are the killer of all consciousness. This is something you've probably heard Caitlin say before. Conclusions are the killer of all consciousness. As soon as we think we've got the answer, we've lost the plot. We're always asking questions. And even with our truth testing, if you're trying to get to the right answer, you've lost the point. You're mm -hmm. not going to get it. You're already creating confusion in your field or someone else's. So curiosity is how we stay in that, um, that space that Caitlin was talking about where you're like, you're open, but you're skeptical yeah. and you're using discernment, which is our next one. <laughs> So we follow the energy trails, you know, and we track the full metamere. This is what Caitlin was talking about in the integrity piece and the scope of practice. We track, we go, okay, so here's the situation I'm seeing. If I take this piece out, what happens? What's the ripple effect? And how do I need to support that person or myself to move through that? Is that actually the outcome that is best for me? Or do I need to scale this back and try something else? So we're using our own radar system to track our, um, to track what's going on around us or in our body, or if we're working with someone else to track them. And we're going all the way from the very beginning, where did this originate the point of origin? Where did this start all the way through everything that's going to trickle down when you change something and what needs to happen on the other side of that. Um, and then being an observer, that's part of it too. Um, not getting like stuck in the story of it. Right. Um, adaptability is a really big one because we know that sometimes things change and sometimes we need to pivot and there's, there's nothing wrong with changing your mind or changing direction as long as you're doing so in integrity. Like some people will say that they think integrity means um, like always following through with the thing you said you were going to do from start to finish, but that's not how we see it. We feel like as long as you're doing it in a way that you're being adaptable and you're following up with the people that you said you were going to do things with and you know communicating <laughs> what your new plans are you're still in integrity so adaptability is just the ability to really shift quickly with the energy as the energy changes um, and not getting stuck in a in a stagnant space not leaving issues lingering even though the conversation might be uncomfortable you're going to have it with that person and then resilience. So that's, that's, like, that's the part, like, let's talk about that yeah. and having conversations with the person, even though it's going to be uncomfortable. You know, I think that goes both on the client and the practitioner. 100%. Right? Like many of you guys that are here listening to this now have been in the client seat. And so part of that integrity is when things aren't right, taking it back to the practitioner and saying, hey, like things aren't right here's what I'm experiencing now. Here's what's going on in my body. Like this doesn't feel balanced. Like that's on you in your integrity to bring it back. Because if you don't, that practitioner doesn't have any clue. Well, they might have a niggle, but they don't necessarily have a clue that what they did was not necessarily the right thing for your body. And so that follow-up on behalf of the client and reaching back out to them and you know, opening it in a kind way too, with compassion, because we all know that sometimes when we move one layer of stuff, another layer can surface and it can happen rapidly, especially the more of this we do. It's one thing right after another and you sometimes don't get a break. And so coming back and saying, you know, 24, 48 hours later, Hey, so I've been sitting in this for the last two days and it's really not shifting. I'm really uncomfortable here. I'm stuck in this emotion field. Like something's not quite right. Do you have any tips, ideas, tricks, or did anything else come up in the session that you think we need to relook at? And honestly, within 24 hours, 48 hours, that practitioner should be following up because sometimes we can open things that aren't quite ready to be closed in that short gap of time. Um, and they should have it factored into their fees, which we'll talk a little bit about after, to have follow-up care scheduled in there for that client. Part of it too, though, is when these people follow up with you, if it wasn't, if it didn't meet your expectations, tell, you them. tell them that, because how are they going to know if you're lying to them? You know, and then the other point is, I know like when you're in that state, especially if it's, if, if it really caused a lot of like pain or discomfort in your system, 
it can feel traumatic and you might still be in it, but remembering that by you keeping your mouth shut, you could potentially be allowing, like for lack of a better word, giving this practitioner the chance to repeat the same situation with somebody else, at least do your own due diligence due diligence to bring this to their attention so they're made aware of it and then what they choose to do with it if they are not supportive of you absolutely find somebody else who will be yeah um some practitioners don't have a follow-up plan yeah that's so concerning yeah so typically like when i end a session what i will say to my clients is hey i want you to send me an email in 24 to 48 hours and just let me know how everything is settling. Um, like, just give me a quick synopsis. I want to know where all of this is at. And then I'll check into the email and I'll test like, do they need a quick reply? Does this require more context? Do I need to send them a voice memo? Do I need to tap back into their field and do something with this? And that 24 to 48 hour marker, number one, it's on the client to be accountable if you know I've put this piece in for them because some of them I'll send them the automatic email some of them I will make them be accountable because that's part of what they need to do to change they actually have to come back and do that I won't chase them in that regard yeah. but there's a lot of practitioners that don't follow up um or maybe in the way that they follow up doesn't create an environment where you feel even safe to say something so that might be on us as the practitioners to look at our system and are these people actually coming back and giving us information and openly sharing with us? Because if they're not, we miss the mark in our session there to create that deep relationship that allows us to be this person's helper. Yeah. The other thing is if you're a practitioner and you have that in place, you've got a follow-up plan, you're reaching out to the people, whether it's an automatic follow-up email or a message you send manually to the person. If every single person you're messaging is like, everything's fine, I'm good. And that's like all they're saying, I would be looking at that as something that is concerning. Yeah, that, would be that is flag. probably telling you that they don't feel comfortable talking to you about what's actually going on with them. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely okay. inviting people. So yeah, adaptability, that's moving with the energy, not letting issues linger, and really just speaking up about what's going on. So the last one that we have as a value is resilience. Um, again, we don't expect people to be perfect, but are you hitting new levels? Are, you know, making mistakes is part of it. It's part of growth. When, when we're growing, we're evolving. It's, there's going to be uncomfortable moments. There's going to be times when we're not sure you know, which way is up and um, it doesn't always look pretty, but how do you come out of that? What do you do to follow up with that on your own? Do you just allow that to take you out or um, do you follow the triggers? Do you track them and learn from them? It's like that silver lining, you know, on the dark cloud situation. Um, resilience is super important to us. It's like we said, it's not about how you, how many times you stumble. It's about how you get back up. Yeah. And that key, honestly, we can stop screen sharing now. I think what's, yeah. what's the next page? Is it our get it, want it cable? Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that resilience key is one of the biggest things I have to help many of our practitioners as I'm coaching, right? Because we have our decodes practitioner certifications that we go through and we can talk a little bit about why our, our parameters are so damn strict with that program. Um, but one of the biggest things I have to even coach these people through is resilience because it's not a strength that most humans have right now. You know, I think one of the things that, however you guys want to view success, one of the things that has made me successful is not that I'm the smartest person on the block, not that I'm charismatic or have a face for the camera or any of these things. It's my resilience. And it doesn't matter what gets tossed my way, my mindset is always, huh, interesting. What did I learn? What shifted? What do I have to clean up? Okay, now what do I want to put into play to either prevent this from happening next time or to course correct what's going on in this moment so that I can move forward from it? That's like how I live my life too, it, forever. You know, it's like, how can I learn from this? How can I make sure this situation never happens again? How can I make sure, you know, that I'm 
overcoming this so I'm not repeating it. Like that's one of the ways that we get into those Akashic loops, you guys, is by not learning from the mistake and just continuing to repeat it. Yeah, and so I've seen a couple of comments here on the live stream that we're doing about people saying like, well, what if nothing really has changed? How do you say that to your practitioner? Well, you go back and you say, hey, I, these are the key points I remember talking about and I'm moving forward in my life and I haven't really noticed any real shifts at this time. That's it. That's all yeah. you got to say. Yeah. Right? The um, other thing that I will add to that is when you're, as the, as the person attending the session, so like a lot of these values are like, they work for both. So mm -hmm. if you're the one attending a session with a healer, with a coach, with a practitioner, um, it's a really good idea to come with some sort of a goal or something that you specifically want to address. So you're not just showing up and going, I don't know, <laughs> because if you come in with nothing, it's possible that you could come up with something really amazing, but it's also equally possible that you guys are just going to sit there and not accomplish a whole lot. So being clear on what it is you're wanting to get out of the session and communicating with, with the practitioner at the very beginning. So they know where you stand and can talk to you about maybe if your expectations are a little out, out there and not really in alignment with, with what they're able to do. Like just bring it up at the very beginning. Be like, this is why I booked this session. This is what I'm hoping to get out of it. Is that something you think you can help me with? Is that your wheelhouse? And then they can talk to you about that. Um, because if you have an, an idea of what you want healed going into it and you don't communicate that to that person, they're going to do whatever they can, but it might not be the thing that you want. And then at the end, if, you know, if they do the follow-up and, and you're like, yeah, I didn't really notice anything. Um, it's a, it's also a good idea to look at what did it, what do you want out of this follow-up? What are you hoping to get out of it? If it's that you really feel like you need some sort of a follow-up session, what are you willing to do or trade or whatever to make that happen? Like I personally, in all my interactions, figure out what it, what my boundaries are before I go into them so that when they offer it, I can say yes or no, that's in alignment with me. Mm -hmm. So whether that's, you know, like I, I want a follow-up session to get this cleaned up and I'm willing to pay for it. Then when they offer you that, you can decide to take it. Or you say, look, you just did way more damage than you helped. And so I need you to make it right by giving me a follow-up session. If you're willing to work with them, that's the key. If you're actually willing to work with them at this point um, and I'm not willing to pay for it, then, then you pass that back to them and they get to decide what's in alignment with them. And from there, you can decide to go with it or not. Mm -hmm. This is the communication piece. We have to tell people what we're looking for. We have to advocate for ourselves on both ends. Totally. Um, and another question that was coming in, people were asking, like, am I the only one doing cleanup? I don't think so. It would be asinine to believe that would be true. And I think this is totally timed with a lot of these different shifts that are happening with that secondary axis coming in, with people accelerating really quickly. Here's the thing, just because I accelerated doesn't mean I need to accelerate you. And so many people miss that. My journey isn't your journey. Just because I accelerated doesn't mean I need to accelerate you. And, and my mission and my timelines are relevant to my experience and maybe a couple others, but it's not going to be the blanket statement. And so we need to be adaptable as a healer to be able to slide along the entire scale of what a person might need. Yeah. Right. And if you get so narrow minded that all you can see and all you want to play with is this one frequency of energy you're going to hurt people. You are hurting people because you won't see the entire picture. You'll just see what you want to see and what lights you up and what focuses um, your excitement, right? In your body, in your timelines. So I think, I think there's lots of things to consider here on all of these elements. And, you know, somebody also asked, does this apply like with our mentors in decodes? Um, yeah, I should hope so. I should hope so, because if they're not showing up to the degree that they should be, or you haven't gotten, you know, some shifts that you desired, then first you of all, to talk to them, talk to them. Don't talk to me first, go back to them because they're your mentor and say, Hey, like, here's some of the key elements I wanted to work on. We haven't felt any shifts with this yet. What's like, what have you seen? Is there anything I'm missing? Is there anything we're missing? Do we need to go back to the drawing table? 
like the two of you have to become a team first and and that should be with any practitioner really but we'll just bring this down to like the ones I actually employ and hire and train Mm -hmm. but it should be going back there first to become a team and bring it back to their awareness because I can tell you like especially some of our advanced guys, you bring that back into their fields. You better believe that they're potting on it. They're researching. They're like, what did I miss? What is my brain not seeing here? They're with their peers. And they're like, guys, I have a client a who is got this, this, and this we've gotten this far, but we're stuck. Like I'm missing something like the, the advanced ones think like this and they're sequencing, they're putting things together. They need to know though. If you don't tell them, if we don't know, we can't grow we don't know, we can't help. And so playing aloof and being like, whatever, it's just what it's supposed to be. You're not helping anybody. Yeah. Or making up a story about how, well, they're clearly just not very good at what they do, or they just don't care about me. Like that's just making up a story. You don't actually know that until you've talked to them to find out why the session went the way it did and what their perspective is. Cause it's possible that they, don't know that it went bad or maybe they do and they're still on the back end doing some research and trying to figure it out so they can come back to you and be like look here's what I found since our last session like you you don't know until you talk to them yeah and we have a lot of our um people jumping in the comments they're like yeah I would want to know and I think that's a big thing like I think we make assumptions that we're going to hurt people's feelings yeah when we talk to them and who cares who cares? I mean, if you hurt their feelings or you didn't do it, number one, it's their own trigger to look at. And number two, it's not your job to manage how they feel about it. It's your job to manage how you communicate it. And if you're communicating from a space of communion and curiosity and observation, and that practitioner, no matter who they are, can look at that and go, this person is really, you know, breaking this down and looking where they're at. Like, let's come in and ask some questions. If they truly are a healer, they're going to look at that and go, how do we both go further together? If they're not a healer, they're going to bypass and go, I'm just not the right one for you. Yeah. Yeah. Or like they're, they're just, yeah, they're going to bypass. That's exactly what's going to happen. But at least you did your part. You did everything that you could to make sure you were a advocating for yourself and be communicating with them about how it went. So yeah, hiding things in the dark is not the way to go. We can't do that anymore going forward. No. So let's circle this conversation up and then um, give you guys some tangible things that you can look at. Yeah. So one, I think maybe there's three core things we could get you guys to look at. Number one is I would really love for each of you who is a helper or practitioner in your own way to really decide on what your morals and ethics, what your true north looks like and what your... Um, I guess, core values are going to be as you bring you and your work out into the world and you begin working with others. Because if you have that and you know that, and you know the things that are important for you and your behaviors and your actions, you're always going to try to do best by your clients. Always. And just little hint there with the value stuff. If you write those down, everything, every opportunity that comes your way, every situation you find yourself in, if you refer back to those, it will tell you exactly how you need to respond and move forward. Yeah, it's It's exactly how Violet and I measure our own stuff. It's how we measure each of our team's performance. It's how we make decisions about the healers that are on our team, on our directories or not. This is how we figure out everything because it's so clear. It allows us to make quick decisions without story. Super easy. Like it's going to cut all of that like decision-making down by a lot. So do it. It's worth it. So that exercise, while it's tricky, I think it's well worth it. And you may want to listen to some podcasts about life coaching or about um, morals and ethics, things like this. You may want to look up co- like keywords that go along with this subject to see what else comes up, yeah. to see what other kind of words are important to you or other kinds of principles might be in your reality as a practitioner. I mean, you don't want to have a list of like 18 things because that's really big. <laughs> Try and narrow it down to a reasonable list that yeah. feels like. What I've heard is basically right. anywhere between three to seven, any more than that. And it's getting to be too wishy-washy 
all of your other like values should fit into one of those as an overarching category. So yeah, that's a that's a great idea. I highly recommend you guys look at what your values are, even if you're not a practitioner, even in whatever job you're doing, or even as a parent, you can look at your own values because it's going to help you make decisions about what's coming up when it arises. Totally. Mm -hmm. um, the next one I would suggest you guys do on the practitioner side it would be to look at the environment you're cultivating in your sessions. And does that person actually come forward and develop a voice and open communion and communication with you and your support and follow up after? Are you actually creating an entire journey for that person where they are seen, heard, and held and nurtured from start to finish? So I would look at that whole runway and look at where you might be dropping the ball as to why some of these clients are not coming back to you and why they might be running to somebody like me. Yeah, there's one potential that I see a lot of people start to embody when they start to really feel confident in their skills and their abilities and they know that they have the potential to get people real results and they start operating as a business. And it's a really interesting one that I've seen a few people get sucked into is this idea of, um, well, my time is worth so much and I'm not going to work for free. And so what they do is they limit the, the time that they're willing to converse with other people to that session, which boundaries are important. I, I do think we need to be paying attention to the boundaries we're creating, not overextending ourselves or making ourselves into this savior, like, you know, but the opposite side of that is literally forcing every person who interacts with you to pay you like hundreds of dollars to do so and not being willing to follow through on that. So if you're in this situation where you have had one single session with a few people and never really have follow-ups and nobody ever comes back and gives you feedback, you're not getting testimonials, maybe you're even finding it hard to get people on your page, even though you're showing up in your business, maybe look at where your boundaries are too tight. Mm -hmm. That's a good one too. So mm -hmm. I factor that into my pricing. We can talk about pricing as our very last yeah, thing. Yeah, that's a great but idea. I factor that into my pricing as I look at these sessions of the energy exchange is to have a buffer in there that feels really good to be looking after those follow-up calls or mm -hmm. emails, texts, whatever. Um, so number two, if you are on the client side of it, is to look at your patterns of actually advocating and speaking up for yourself and being in communication with people that you perceive to know more, be more or better than you. And the reason I would love for you to look at this is because if you can start looking at some of those patterns and you can start going, this is just this person's wheelhouse, but I have mine over here and I need to be able to share equally with them as they're sharing equally with me, it gets a lot easier for you guys to bring and cross threads back and forth. No more hiding, no more playing aloof, right? To your situation that's going on in life. That's not yeah. going to get you anywhere. Yeah. And I think the last one I would give to everybody is I would really, oh, this is a hard one to word without sounding like a donkey. <laughs> um, just because you're interested or you want to do a specific thing, or you think things have to go at a specific speed, frequency, et cetera, doesn't mean it's the right thing for you, your body, the client, the practitioner in that moment. And if you don't know how to test those trajectories all the way through, you shouldn't be running in those energy fields. 100%. So having those... Um, I don't want to say expectations. I need a different word, but understanding what you can handle at your a period limits. of time, right? And that, knowing your, your limits, your current set of limits, knowing that, yes, they can change as you grow. You're not stuck in it, but in this particular moment in time, what are you actually capable of doing? What have you proven to yourself that you can do? What have you proven to others? And, um, you know, just being very aware of that with the choices you're making. Yeah, I think those are all big keys that you guys can look at um, and take home. And at the end of the day, like everybody is their own individual and you get to run your ship how you want to run your ship, right? Mm -hmm. Not everybody is going to come up with the same morals and ethics. And that's the beauty of this world is you will find somebody who aligns with as closely to how you 
believe your core values and ethics should be. And you'll find other people who feel the same way. Yeah, hundred percent. Right? So not everybody's going to have the same ones that we have. Those, yeah. those were just the ones we wanted to share because that's what we do. That's our, you know, and if somebody is really outside of that, we're probably not the people for them. Mm-hmm. It's so true. So let's wrap up with a quick conversation about money. Yeah. We have some kind of interesting beliefs about this, actually. Um, I know yours are a little bit more intense than mine. Yeah. Well, I worked in money, so it's it's different. (laughs) I know. So let's go from this angle first. Okay. I had a really entertaining weekend. Yeah. I had an entertaining weekend because we did a giveaway last week in Healers Rising of doing this matchmaker thing where uh, we were matching one of our people with one of our decodes practitioners. Yeah. And the decodes giving away free sessions. Free sessions. Yeah. And it was really fun. Yeah. And um, then the practitioners started to invoice us because the session was on us, right? We were going to bill them. And uh, there things come in. And I notice some of them are charging more than me and have not proven that they can do more than me. And I was like, whoa, that's interesting. And then I kind of take a look at their calendars and how much openings they have and bookings that were there. And I'm like, there is something to be said about align, alignment and congruence with what you guys are charging in your practice. And if your practice isn't full, this may be another pillar you want to look at for your integrity and your adaptability piece. People in this stratosphere have uh, a grid built in. I'm, I'm giving you guys some of my trade secrets right now. You're going to want to write this down. And if you're triggered about it, you're going to want to clear it because I'm telling you, as soon as you figure this out and you install it, things will shift. Mm -hmm. People in this industry have a grid that they have themselves plugged into that when they're going to go and hire a psychic, a healer, intuitive, whatever, there are certain number bars that they are willing to pay rates on. And then when it goes below that or above that, they'll balk and come out because there is a very thin window of what feels in integrity for the client to book. And I watch healers shoot themselves in the foot with this all the time because they're trying to say that my self-worth and my value is worth X amount of dollars, right? But what they're forgetting to check into is there actually is a grid behind everybody who is booking healing and is a part of this stuff and requires these gateways. They haven't gotten the memo, read the message. And so if you guys are brand new beginners, ish and brand new beginners i'm saying if you are under like 500 sessions complete with real results of people who have said i am no longer suffering from you are a beginner in this meat suit you still have not mastered this if your rates are over about 111 dollars you're not going to get booked people can feel it you might get like one or two the odd person that comes back but your books won't fill Because people will look at all of the the different logic parameters and go, oh, yeah, no, this person's not that popular on social media yet. They don't have a lot of reviews. Like they don't have like a big following. So I don't know if they're actually good or not yet. And so they won't spend more than that. There's about a glass ceiling there. So, you know, what I recommend to all of our decode oneers is I tell them like set your session rates somewhere between about 80 to $111. That's about your range that you can charge when you're a brand new beginner up until you have like those real results and about a 500 person client base that you've gotten those sessions under your belt. Now, when you come into that next level of experience window and you're kind of between that, like, I don't know, 500 to about 1500 people, you can, the grid there is at about 111 to about $150. Mm-hmm. And yeah, this is in Canadian dollars that I'm speaking about right now. So it's about 111 to $150. And if you are below that, people perceive that you might be one of those sideshow like psychics. And if you're above that, people start to perceive that you're probably a ripoff and trying to just take them for a ride. It's fascinating. This And this is just the grid. Like, Unless you have a really large following, which adds mm-hmm. to your credence. Depend, like, yeah. 
outside of that. So there, people are going to start looking like, why are they charging this much? Do they have a huge audience? They're going to start looking at these things. Has is somebody their calendar back- full? Is their calendar full? Yeah. If, if it's really easy, if they can get in with you in like three, four, even seven days and you're charging. No, like tomorrow, which most of the healers I see, like if I can get on your calendar tomorrow, people are not going to book. It just doesn't jive, right? It just feels yeah. off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then we have the advanced practitioners. Now, these are the ones that have big results, like cancer is cured, MS gone, fibromyalgia gone, allergies out, like multiple times over and over and over again. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I can take proven results, not proven results, not just I learned how to do this in a course, but like I've proven I can do it. I have put it into practice. People have I've worked with people and this has been the result on a consistent basis. Yeah. Yeah. So at about like those 1500 sessions complete and up between about $150 to 250 is the sweet spot. It's kind of the sweet spot. And when you're getting over that, people start getting into a little bit of the showman grid, which is kind of interesting. Um, they get a little bit into the showman grid, which is a whole different type of psychic they're hiring, right? Mm-hmm. At that point, they're not necessarily looking for a healer. They're looking for a witch doctor. They're looking for entertainment, else. some entertainment. kind of a show. Yeah. yeah. So if your sessions and your calendars aren't booked, if your clients aren't returning, these are a whole bunch of keys you guys can look at. And, you know, those of you guys that are buying sessions from people, take a look at your purchasing decisions go back and map it. Right. And it is a dance. Like when we start out, we have to play with numbers. We've got to try a few things, see what actually works, but you will notice if you're a healer, if you're charging too much, you're going to probably notice that people have really high expectations about what you can deliver. That might be outside your actual scope of practice and abilities. And if you're undercharging, people might not be booking with you because they think that you're just like not able to do a whole lot of anything. So it's a balance. It's, it's testing things out. It's, it's trying them on, but we don't only do it intuitively based on what feels good. (laughs) There's a hundred percent, like there is a grid to it. And if we started tracking all the way out and we actually were willing to look at the bigger picture and look at the entire resonance field of everybody who is courted and contracted come here to play with this whole healing field, we would learn so much more about how to build and operate businesses that were in integrity and be so much more abundant for it but we're so set in our ways of having to just like follow into our our intuition price things based on the transformation people are get or price things based on what we perceive our hourly value to be or what the guru told you to price it at yeah you guys don't have to listen to us either but this is just what we've noticed you know I I'm, I'm a little bit more like, and I also look at things from more of like a consumer standpoint, not that I like to call myself that, but I don't offer sessions. So I don't look at it necessarily from that point of view. I tend to look at it from somebody who would be booking a session and, Mm -hmm. um, it's really easy to get into a state of like, well, I'm not plugged into that grid, but your clients probably are like, we, we look at money as a, as a statement of value and a promise and, you know, if I give you this amount, then I'm getting something in return that is equal to that, right? So we, we just need to be aware of it. Well, and that's just it. I, I use this statement all the time. Use the system to break the system. 100%. And if this is what the people are currently using to drive their purchasing decisions, their sign-up decisions, then I need to use that as the gateway to get them into my field so then I can start fracturing the system and helping them get to where they want to go. Simple as that. Mm-hmm.